Hi, I'm Wells Thompson, co-writer of Mechaton and Frankenstein the Unconquered. You can find me on Twitter at Wells Thomp. On Ko-Fi, you can buy our comics, sofi.com slash Wells Thompson. And on any uh, current or future Kickstarters, you can get all of our comics. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Dalton Shannon, co-writer of Frankenstein the Unconquered and Mechaton. Uh, you can find me on any social media that matters at Dalton K. Shannon. Uh, and you're watching Three Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are here on Two Geeks Talking with not one, but two very talented and creative people. They are co-writers for some comics that you probably have already seen and one comic that is going to have a Kickstarter campaign coming up very shortly. We're joined today by the ever-talented Wells Thompson and Dalton K. Shannon, co-writers of Frankenstein the Unconquered and Mechaton. How are you guys doing today? Fantastic. Well, I have a feeling that uh, you're doing a little more fantastic at Dragon Con this weekend. Currently, at time of recording, at the greatest place on Earth, Nerd Mecca Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia. And it is fantastic. Met Leanna Kangas, met up with my editor, have some friends over here. Yeah, really fantastic place to be. That is one con that I've always wanted to go to, but I've never had a chance to. I, so, I, same. I see the excitement. That's the main thing. The excitement about, you know, being at a convention, the excitement of, of course, Frankenstein, the Unconquered, and of course, Mechaton. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, uh, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm Dalton K. Shannon, co-writer of, like you said, Frankenstein and, and Mechaton. Been doing the, the comics game for a few years now. Wells, it feels like an eternity, honestly. Bring in action-packed monsters, action-packed mechs, mostly action-packed everything. Um, if we can pack action into it, we will, along with swords and horror. Fun characters, hopefully. You know, we'll see. My name is Wells Thompson. I'm a comic book writer, editor, a reviewer for the comic book Yeti. We work together on comics, horror, side Sci-fi. I often say anything I can put tentacles in is is my genre. Uh, just character driven genre fiction that usually has some kind of magical realist or, or sci-fi or horror bent to it. Yeah, we just try and make good stories that are a lot of fun to read. Let's start with Mecha Ten first because I actually ended up getting a Twitter comment about that. Uh, I don't know if they are part of your team uh, or not. <laughs> That's yeah. Fernando. Yeah. As much because the way it was worded, I was like, hmm, am I being catfished on this one? <laughs> Eek, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Mechaton first, and we'll jump into Frankenstein. Mechaton <laughs> is a sci-fi rule of cool comic about a alien glove that crash lands on Earth. Brother and sister find it and discover that anything they punch turns into a mech, whether it's a hot dog cart or a house or something bigger that I'm not going to spoil. It's a mech and kaiju punch em up comic that has the, like borders on shonen tropes and has a lot of heart, a lot of fun characters, very like Scott Pilgrim meets Pacific Rim. Besides the spoiler that you can't, you won't say, which is fine. What was the craziest idea you both came up with when putting that story together? Honestly, Mechaton is built on crazy idea after crazy idea. Like I think we set the standard for a unique mech every issue. So we always have to be thinking of what what's he punching this issue or what's he like casually just tapping. It doesn't even mean to turn into a mech, but it turns into a mech. I mean, the hot dog cart was pretty wild to begin with. Like, I think that really sets the tone of like, oh, that's what this book is. And then, of course, you know, you get you get houses and you get all the trucks, cars, anything and everything gets punched. So we just always try and top ourselves. And Fernando helps a ton with that, too. Like his design work is phenomenal we could tell him to make a mech out of like a, a public library and a strip mall and he would be like oh yeah no here you go this always existed it's incredible i think the craziest idea we've had don't know if this will actually show up in the comic or not but just like we're constantly talking to each other about what could we do what what's the craziest thing we could do is there a way for the glove to like punch the comic itself so that the panels deconstruct and become the mech yeah <laughs> And that's a little wild. I don't know if we could pull that off, but it is probably the most out there idea we've had. We have definitely talked about giving people an origami comic book so that you can construct the mech with Derek. Yeah, I don't know how that would work. It would never work, but we've had those conversations. <laughs> you could do it as like a last page or something where they could just tear it out and make something. You, Anything that gets form involved. Up to 
origami expert. Dragon Con, come on. You, there has to be someone there. There's something for everyone here, so I'm yeah. sure. I mean, you'd be literally breaking the fourth wall of the comic book to make this robot. Yeah, that's I, to me, that's pretty cool. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's that's like the, that's the end goal, is to to break the found. That, that's the end goal of postmodernism, is to, to break the foundations of the story itself, right? Like, this, this is what we've been leading towards. And As a culture, we've been leading towards an origami robot from a comic book. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's great. So then, uh, what has the the fan response been to to Mecha Ten? Because just hearing your enthusiasm about it is amazing in itself. The fan reaction has to be incredible, especially with the amount of uh, amazing kickstarters you've had recently. The outreach has been really, really exciting and heartwarming. I love the hell out of any time anyone comes up to me and is like, "I love your book. I, I read it." Mm-hmm. And- really happy we've gotten extremely positive feedback so far people get hooked by the kind of crazy imagery and the idea of like a mech that could be made out of anything but usually what they're coming up to us to to compliment us on is like uh, these characters feel really like Mm -hmm. real dialogue is super spot on the book is really funny this feels like a real brother and sister it's not like the some hackneyed writing that you get on on like the cw when they're (laughs) so siblings but it looks like they met that morning there's a warmth to the characters that i think translates uh even to people who like wouldn't normally gravitate towards sci-fi agreed like and honestly some of the most fun i get out of hearing people talk about mechaton is when i tell people about mechaton for the first time and all i say is they punch anything and it becomes a mech and their eyes get about this big <laughs> They're like, oh, oh, okay. I'm, I'm here now. Now, g- give me the rest, and that, that, that's honestly all the hook you need. You know, world building is is always amazing in itself because I think that's that's a true epitome of not only a, a writer's imagination and the fact that you have two amazing brains putting this at least comic together. Don't worry, we'll get to Frankenstein in, in a bit. <laughs> now that now now we're on the mech train, so you. Know, it, it is what it is. It doesn't stop. The world itself that you both have, have put together and built here, what was the, besides the concept of, of punching something, what else was the true spark to making this world feel alive? Because I think that's the a true epitome of, of great writing. I know that for Wells and, and myself as siblings, we aren't siblings, but we both have siblings. The thing that really makes Mechaton feel real and like an actual world, uh, I think, is the dynamic between the two main characters, Derek and Leah. Their sibling dynamic, we really pull from our own sibling relationships, and we try our best to make that feel as authentic as possible. And I think if you get that right, then the rest of the world starts to build around that. Everything starts to kind of fall into place when the relationships between your characters feel authentic. You don't necessarily need all this Tolkien-esque lore around the world to make the world feel lived in and believable, as long as your characters feel believable. And I think that that is the real spark of the book. I agree with that. I would add that like it does start in space. The first four pages are, are, are a space battle. So there are like greater world building elements. But the thing that kind of anchors it all together is the characters and the sense of sort of community that the world is built on. You know, there are small business owners, there are family friends, uh, and they're all kind of subtly working together toward you know just a goal of being a better community and being better toward each other uh and that energy sort of bounces off the characters and makes the world feel a little bit more visceral and and kind in in a way that i really enjoy let's talk about the next comic here frankenstein the unconquered great title beautiful art by the way beautiful art on both of these fernando pinto does the art on mechaton he's the one who raised the question about mechaton (laughs) Well, yeah which is why we were laughing about it yeah uh but yeah all the artists work with are so incredibly talented we feel really privileged to be able to work with them is it the same team for both books or is it two two different teams two different teams we do share a letterer and a designer respectively nathan kemp a french letterer really super incredibly nice guy and really really creative and professional in his lettering and then designer and brenda snelby she created our logos she creates not page layouts not the panel layouts but the layout for the book she helps us create both of them work really hard on these books uh so full credit to them the cover artist the artist and the colorist change between the books Mechaton, it's fernando pinto and mainly Meg Casey that we've had Fred Stressing come on and help as well for the colors. Fernando Pinto on art, we have one variant every issue. The last one was we did was Jay Sheik doing an homage to Spider-Man 219 where he's in jail with the giant Spider-Man behind him. And we put a uh, big house robot behind Derek because he's in jail. 
And then for uh, Frankenstein the Unconquered, it's a young Canadian artist named Mary Landro, who is super talented, works with Todd McFarlane, like has this incredibly like distinct, intense cross-hatching style that I, I love for the book. Colors by uh, Dahlia Maha, who is Brazilian colorist, really has a really like interesting diatonal style that makes a really dramatic contrast. And then our cover artist, Heather Vaughn, who is up and coming comic artist that just looks, I mean, all of her art is incredible, but she's doing like a very abstracted Frank Frenzetta. Frank Frenzetta. She's doing like some, sort of her homage to that on the Frankenstein covers. Talk about Frankenstein, the Unconquered, because as soon as I saw just the first couple of pages you sent me, I was like, holy shit, this is beautiful. Blew me out of the water from the cover to the first few pages that I, I got to see. The The action is intense and and the dialogue and, and at least narration that goes along with it is is truly amazing. So how did this story come about? Oh, we've been doing Frankenstein for about as uh, as long as we've been uh, collaborators, honestly. Frank was one of the first ideas that we did. Actually, right here, um, we did eight-page ash cans together. We were doing them as like exercises. So we hand drew all of this, you know, stapled them all together, sold them at conventions. Frank started as just, I wanted to do space pulp initially with Frank having a sword in space. Then that quickly turned into Frank as Conan. And the idea of not only having the literary Frankenstein, so a, a sequel to Shelley's novel, wielding a sword and fighting uh, bombed out apocalypse monsters, but also this chance to really like for the, the monster as a, uh, a force of nature. It was just too good to pass up. And so, and, and it just kind of flows naturally when you're working with um, like literary horror tropes, pulp tropes, it all just kind of seem to just fall into place. And uh, we've been working with Frank ever since. He's always been one of the plates that have been spinning. Uh, and now he's in his own ongoing series. And uh, it's it's so exciting. The idea of the book is just kind of too juicy for us to pass up, both as like, I come from a literature background. So the idea of playing with a classic character like that, and sort of exploring themes that were present in the novel, but don't get discussed often, environmentalism and toxic masculinity and things like that. Those are all really present in this version of the character, but it also gives us a chance to like make our love letter to old pulp comics like Conan and Universal Horror Film, those kind of old school, pulpy, kitschy uh, properties that are at once sort of larger than life, you know, at the same time can be so over the top they almost become self-parody and that's sort of like where frank sits it's like it takes itself so seriously it's it kind of becomes self-parody at least to us that's how we we've, we've always viewed it the prose becomes so purple so quick <laughs> and honestly the idea is so cool i'm i was honestly shocked that nobody else had done it so if we didn't do it somebody would and so i'm glad that we got on the, the ground first and you've been running with it for for a while now too, and and it's amazing, true. Well, thank you. What's the most misunderstood aspect about maybe literary horror and the pulp genre that maybe people that don't understand those genres misinterpret? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> I think an easy misinterpretation of especially pulp fiction is this sense of power fantasy. I think everyone likes to imagine themselves as Doc Savage without actually thinking about the consequences of being Doc Savage or, or who that guy means in the world that he inhabits, especially like as a, as a kid growing up and seeing all of this, this media and uh, like the universal monster movies, like it's very easy to take in the aesthetic of it and not really think about what the aesthetic is on top of because the stuff is so cool. It's visually stunning to a kid. It's just something it, it's otherworldly. It's phenomenal. Unless you dig underneath that aesthetic as you get older then uh, you're going to lose a lot of that theming, that that kind of warning signal that a lot of horror, especially literary horror, tends to shine. And I think a lot of misunderstanding comes from not growing with the material and just continuously communicating with it on a surface aesthetic level. That notion I hear all the time of like, oh, why can't this just be like a comfort thing, like the, a comfort story mm -hmm. that I, I'm like... Oh, so you missed the point entirely. <laughs> not, not to. Frankenstein's not, not supposed to be comfortable. Yeah, not to shame anyone for like enjoying something and and find and trying to, you know, engage with it on a on a simplicity level, but at the same time to take Frank 
Einstein as, as an example, I think it's easy to get caught up in like the aesthetics of it and the, the horror of it and just think it's kind of all in good fun and not really look at like, I hear the, the, the sentiment that the scientist is Frankenstein and the creature is the monster. And I'm like, I think the point of the novel is that the scientist is the monster. <laughs> I think that's where the novel kind of wants you to engage with it is in turning that around to criticize Victor and not just solely be afraid of the monster who is fearsome, who does some pretty messed up things. And there's lots of layers to that character as well. But I feel like in both instances, both characters get kind of boiled down to their basic traits. And that's something we wanted to kind of, I guess, mull over and talk about in this book, show some of those nuances, peel back the onion a little bit and show how they grow and change as characters from one interpretation to the other. What is your creative kryptonite? Ooh, the kryptonite. money. The kryptonite is literally kryptonite. <laughs> I think that the biggest wall I, I come up with personally is just when rubber meets the road and we have to take this cool idea that could be anything and make it into something that's real. And those limitations can be really important, but also like in a completely different project that I've discussed with Dalton, for example, the idea is big enough that it could stretch to like two, 300 pages if I want to make it into a thing, I've got about 100 pages to work with because every page costs money and I am not don't have an infinite amount of that, which is why things like Kickstarter are so important so that we can continue making stuff at a reasonable pace and, and get it out there and get our stories told. Otherwise, we would be working on... We, we might release one comic every two years just based on like our own personal finances. <laughs> We need that method of, of getting things through. But yeah, the limitation of just not being able to uh, make an infinite amount of pages <laughs> for a story is, is my personal kryptonite. Seconded, but also I think what's great about working uh, with the co-writer and Wells specifically is that both of us cover each other's kryptonite a bit. How I like to describe it is... Uh, I keep the wagon moving and Wells keeps the wheels on the wagon. My personal kryptonite is I'm really great with characters and, and action and momentum, but I'm not super great at theming and, uh, you know, like that through line of the narrative. I'm a very moment to moment kind of writer. And, and Wells is very big picture. What does this mean? How do we thread the needle here? Uh, and Wells is also very good at, at characters and, and action. He just might need a little nudge in the action department. So like whenever he's got something going that maybe isn't, going fast enough, I can come in and kind of do that. Or if I'm doing something that doesn't make sense to the rest of the plot, Wells can be like, why is this here? And no, because it looks cool, isn't a good enough answer. So we balance each other out and we handle each other's kryptonite in a way that the final product actually ends up being better than we could have ever done by ourselves. It's a very close sort of intimate co-writer, co-editor mm -hmm. relation. Yeah, no, absolutely makes the, the end product feel extremely seamless even though uh it's the product of two people i mean sometimes just bashing our heads against the wall for many days in a row just being like well what if this happened or like ah, oh, it's stupid if you're an astute enough reader you may be able to tell uh panel by panel who wrote which line of dialogue but like at the end of the day it's supposed to feel seamless <laughs> well that's the the best effort of, of being a collaborative team and it's like uh -huh. you 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 know each other's styles and flow and what you put out is a testament to you know not killing each other in the writing process and putting together a good product we try we try not to kill each other it, it gets rough sometimes especially in that like third or fourth draft no being separated physically by uh many hundred if not thousands of miles of land distance is an incredibly helpful thing when it comes to not I can't imagine going to an office with you every day. Oh boy, that'd be rough. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd get through it. Who ate my lunch? Dalton, was it you? <laughs> Dalton, you're the only other person in this office. I know it was you. And uh, he, he's, look, no, no, it wasn't. Why why would I touch your stupid sandwich? All it has is vegetables on it. You know, looking at the at the creative pro creative process that you both have gone through with, uh, of course, Frankenstein and, and Makaton, you touched on themes of the literary works and the classics mm -hmm. as well too. But what are some themes that spoke with you both, especially with uh, Frankenstein and Makaton, that makes you excited for writing future issues? I think with Makaton, at least, like I said, Wells is really good at, at nailing down on what 
of piece is about when I first brought the very concept of Mechaton to him, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if this punched a thing and it made a robot? Wells actually was like, oh, so it's a story about community and working with what you've got and making this thing work as a collective unit rather than just alone. And I'm like, yes, sure. That's great. Let's roll with it. When I hear that from Wells, I'm like, oh no, that's brilliant. I, I love that. Now that I've caught onto the scent of that, like I can really dig into it and and show certain uh, like so certain panels mean more now when I'm writing them because of uh, having that in in mind rather than just seat of my pants writing and going back and plugging it in later which is how I normally write with Mechaton specifically that that always stands out to me as something that's always worth exploring and uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it by myself for Mechaton that was sort of what I had always seen in in the idea was like, oh, this is about coming together, working with taking something that's not supposed to be a robot, turning it into a robot to solve a common problem. Those themes kind of stood out to me right away. But the thing that excites me about it, the thing that gets me going back is the relationships between the characters. The brother and sister dynamic is super fleshed out. The relationship between the sister, Leah, and her significant other, Hex, is really interesting to me. And I love writing those characters because I really like media that portrays solid loving relationships between people and sort of models like what a good relationship is supposed to be rather than playing it for cheap conflict so that is something that always excites me about like what we can do moving forward and how we can show those relationships develop and then for frankenstein that is if you haven't caught on tonally they're two extremely different books uh, one is very, like, all-ages, community-oriented, meant to be sort of more comic-leaning than anything. And then Frankenstein is really violent and really intense and dystopic in a lot of ways. So what keeps me going back to Frank and what's interesting to me about Frank is it is sort of the same. It's, it's the relationships, but it's like the breakdown of those relationships, how he keeps putting himself in a position where he could be a good person. He could uh, form a connection with somebody. And there are people that he does have like strong connections with, but he chooses instead to use them as a tool to get what he can out of them and then leave and to leave the situation worse than he did when he came. It excites me to see how that's going to progress and how that's going to catch up with him. Because I think that that's a really interesting point, part of his character. He's not capable of, of seeing a good thing and leaving it alone. He has to get his hands on it and he has to kind of ruin it. To piggyback off of that, with Frank, I love exploring uh, just how he messes all of that up. I mean, most of, a, a lot of my writing starts with a very like primal visual image in the first issue of Frankenstein. He's writing a falling star to earth while he's stabbing it to death. Like that, that's where it starts. And uh, so I, I love putting him in these situations where like he could rise above his base instincts and be uh, a good person for once in his life. Uh, and then completely wreck it in the most spectacular over the st over the top way with a sword and pure hatred cooking up the the imagery that goes along with it to to give that fall a punch that it needs and then of course watching mary bring back the pages to make it even better than i thought it would be i love thinking of ways for frank to mess everything up it's phenomenal that was actually one question I was gonna gonna ask you. The fact that you have, have two different uh, artists and two different, completely different styles for that matter, uh, as well as coloring too. What was a, a scene that you both wrote that looked better once you got the art back? And all of them. It I always don't... looks better. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to think of like one in in particular. I think the one that Dalton is going to point to, that I'm just going to steal it because it came to mind. <laughs> I'll say, I think the single page spread before it, even more than the double page spread, we sent in and it's like, I, I think it's like 12 panels on a single page. It tells a really, it tells the kind of story that you could have told in the entire comic on a single page. We knew going into it, that, that was going to be a really tricky page to make. And we weren't even sure it was technically possible. And then, I mean, not a word, out of Mary, she just send the she just sends it to us. She's like, "Yeah, here it is. How do you what do you like or what do you think?" We're like, "This is amazing. This is perfect." It so her easily been cluttered, and it was mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah. So her her ability to 
create a lot of visual clarity in chaotic scenes and in like story dense scenes as well is spectacular. And it does feel like every page from Frankenstein that we turn in and then get back. It's like, this is so much better than I expected it to be. I mean, especially because as a, a writer, yeah, I have like distinct images in my head when I'm writing, like the double page spread or the him falling from the stars. At the end of the day, it's more of this amorphous idea of it. It's not really like a strong visual. It's it's more like um, shadow figures on the wall of what I'm seeing on the page. So to have any artist take my ramblings in a script and turn it into like full body figures with clarity and movement and action and power, like it's always better than what is in the script. The, the only things that we, we give notes on are like maybe continuity errors that pop up here and there. But other than that, every choice they make is always better than what was in the script. Always. I'll say for uh, Mechaton in issue two, there's this moment where they're basically trying to, to catch up one of the characters on what happened in issue one. So they're like, oh, there, there was a bug that attacked us, uh, the hot dogs were involved, and Derek goes, no, you're telling the story wrong. So we were downtown, and then, like, at that moment, a the next big bad giant insect bursts in through the window and screams in their faces, and it's, like, the size of a house who gets stuck in the window, <laughs> and Derek points and goes, basically that, which was a funny moment when I wrote it, but, like, the, the visual language that Fernando used to create that scene and to make it work is so funny. And I, I just, I think he elevated the joke in every way to just by drawing it in that specific way. I am absolutely blown away by, by both of their styles. And I think they elevate everything that we do in a very real way. What was an early experience where you learned that language of power? Ooh. Huh. It was the, it was the reason we're even working together. Because uh, Wells likes to tell the story. Uh, we were in college. We were in a college writing class, and you know they give they give you these these little short prompts to write a short story over. And uh, the prompt was uh, a first date gone terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a short story uh, where a guy is on a blind date uh, that he met on like Christian Mingle or something, and it's going horribly, horribly wrong. And he doesn't understand why it's going wrong. And at the end of the story, it's revealed that uh, his blind date is a velociraptor. For some reason, that right there convinced Wells that we had to work together from then on. Now I know that words have power because it can trick anybody into working with an idiot like me. In, in fairness, I do want to give some context. The prompt of this assignment was two people go on a blind date and, and one of them has lied on their uh, okay. The reveal that it's a velociraptor is funny. The thing that was funnier to me was that it's from this guy's perspective. And not only does he not realize it, he's also subtly admitting that he's the one who's been lying on his profile. Like, he, like he's the one that is totally in the wrong here, and the date is kind of going wrong because of him. But also, he's too blind to see that it is just a velociraptor in a blonde wig, and that's it. <laughs> and that was just, yeah, that was hysterical to me. So one of the things that made me want to be a writer was, was reading Kurt Vonnegut novels in, like, late middle school or early high school and i always loved the way he plays with language every page is infinitely readable if you if you pick up one of those novels i remember picking up uh, mother night and, and just thinking oh i need to reference something in this and i started reading i couldn't remember exactly where it was so i read the first couple pages and then like i blinked and i was 200 pages into the book going from that to like going back to whatever i was being assigned in school like the star letter or whatever it was it just struck me as like, you can use the exact same tools and make something that is beautiful. You get completely absorbed in it. You lose yourself in the moment and hours go by and you don't even think about it. Or you can tell a story in a way that is brutally painful and makes the reader aware of every thought that they're having and every distraction that they could be doing instead of reading this book. That struck me as a very powerful thing and made me realize that I want to be the kind of writer that you get lost in it. You want to spend all your time there and, and eventually realize that it's been a couple hours and I'm 300 pages into this book and I should really go make dinner. <laughs> but maybe a couple more chapters, you know. That's a better rabbit hole than social media scrolling. Oh, oh yeah. Doom scrolling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully better written too. What is the most important quality 
of a writer in comics today? And how does that translate to what you both have created? I think writing for comics, more than any other medium except for maybe screenwriting, what you're doing is mostly going to be kind of invisible. So one, I would say lack of ego is is definitely important because when you show someone a comic, the last thing they're going to talk about is the writing or anything that, that is really solidly writing. They're going to talk about the art and they might talk about the story in kind of a vague way. And dialogue definitely is important, but like that's almost the letterer's domain at that point by the time it's on the page. So what you're doing as a writer is creating structure and creating like the thematic through lines. I think that's the most important job that a writer has is to create the structure. Well, like Dalton said, keep the wheels on the wagon and let your artist thrive under those conditions and, and elevate the story in their own way. As a writer, you've really got to learn to get out of your artist's way. When we break things down panel by panel and we give each panel description for what should be happening. But at the end of the day, like they have a better idea of what's going to be more visually interesting on the page than, than we are. They will be able to either put it in a different point of view or angle or any, any sort of thing. Uh, and if you're more concerned with the comic being a literal translation of your script, you're in for a rough time. It's a collaborative medium inherently. Uh, so you need to just understand your job of keeping the structure as well said, being open to more ideas. The storytelling is told in the arts, like it's a visual medium. You go, you go panel to panel, and the people who read comics balloon to balloon rather than panel to panel, I think, are doing a disservice to reading comic books. Like it, you've got to take it in as a visual thing first and foremost. So you've got you to just get out of the way. Kickstarters are obviously, or crowdfunding in general, is a second slash third job. How is this upcoming Kickstarter campaign um, different than some of your past campaigns and what are, what have you learned to make these campaigns a little easier not only on yourself but for those that are supporting you hopefully wells will be able to sleep during this coming campaign i doubt it but <laughs> <laughs> he's just a little ball of anxiety we do, we do our best to make sure he's taken care of we're actually doing a lot of things different this time around lowering our prices for one on some of the on a lot of our higher end rewards we're trying to make everything a little bit more accessible for everybody. So if they want to get a lot of extra stuff, they are able to more easily without like really digging in their pockets. We're putting in a lot more work up front, I think, with exactly what we're doing here, trying to uh, get the word out early and be a, a very large presence so that by the time we get to the end, all the work is already done. And we're just kind of to steal a metaphor, you know, we're priming the pump now so that we actually need it to be flowing. We just have to kind of vaguely support in the gesture of it and it's already kind of doing the work for us we have that momentum as far as like staying healthy staying sane i don't know i'll figure it out maybe uh probably i'm just going to be extremely stressed out the entire time <laughs> you know hopefully uh things go really well and i won't have to worry so much and we'll get you know funded at the very beginning and <laughs> do really well for ourselves. That would be cool. But yeah, we're, we're trying a lot of things different and we're trying to make, still make the best product we can, but also make it much more accessible to our backers. If you don't have a reader, you don't have a comic. So they are really the only reason we get to do this. Big thing of, of what we've been doing differently, especially with Mechaton, the, the last Mechaton campaign is really like involving our readers. Wells had that had a brilliant peer reward idea with the adopt a page. And the, the idea of owning a, a physical page of the art of the book and, and getting a shout out in the book itself, it involves the audience a little more so they feel like they have a bit more ownership over, over the book uh, rather than just uh, going to uh, the comic book store of Kickstarter and pulling something off the shelf and, and taking it home. I don't know. I, I think being more mindful of involving audiences yeah. is something where we're trying to be more uh, actively aware of and try to uh, integrate into future campaigns for sure. Yeah. We also have a not safe for work comic for the first time. Kickstarter being Kickstarter, we have to audience once. So, <laughs> so we uh, flops the British artist uh, that does a bunch of uh, pinup style stuff is has been really excited to work. It's very much like pinup bride, but make it not safe for work. Yeah. And we've looked at flops on the last Frankenstein campaign for a print, and that print is gorgeous and phenomenal, and and really. Uh, if you like that print, you'll you'll like the cover. 
everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received in, in your lifetime? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Don't do comics. <laughs> <laughs> so wise. <laughs> <laughs> well so much for that plan <laughs> um, i took it it was just really wise yeah we did yeah or that <laughs> with payer artists and payer artists on time and that's that's <laughs> like the the wisest piece of advice i've been given as a uh as a comic creator if you develop a relationship with someone who doesn't pay well or pay on time no one's going to want to work with you and then it doesn't matter how good the writing is <laughs> yeah uh, I think the, I think legit the the second wisest piece of advice I've gotten, not personally, but from Grant Morrison, they they famously say that nobody pumps the tires. It's in regards to that fanboyism that uh, we all have inherently in our monkey brains, where we try and make everything as as realistic and grounded as possible. So we're like, who pumps the Batmobile's tires? Who does the mechanical work on the Batmobile? Like, how does Bruce go from here to here as Batman? And don't pump the tires, just nobody pumps the tires helps me kind of step back and be like, oh, I don't have to explain every minute detail of this world. As long as it feels lived in and it feels real enough, you don't need every single detail to make it feel real. It can just exist without it having to be grounded. What lessons in life did you learn the hard way? Working with Wells. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with always make a contract. I'm not going to get too far into that. I don't want to call anyone out. But uh, in general, you should, if you're working with someone for money, you should make a contract about it. I learned uh, very early in our careers, very much the hard way, because uh, I've been wanting to do comics since I was like eight years old. I've always been been writing. I've, I've only done writing. I, I've dabbled in art, and I am about as good as a toddler. It took until I was probably 25 when it finally kind of just hit me that, well, one, I, I was broke. So like, I, I couldn't afford artists, but also like nobody wants to draw your stupid stories, especially for free. So that is when I decided to just start doing it myself. That's where the ash can started. I was doing like uh, web comics, just writing my own scripts, drawing my own stories. And none of them were very good, but it created a uh, portfolio and it actually got it got me making stuff rather than just thinking about making stuff. And it was a hard lesson to learn because it was like, oh, I've wasted all these years just thinking, you know, I'd, I'd magically be writing comics. It's a lot harder than that. I'm glad I learned it. Now, here we are, uh, despite it all. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I was very inspired, probably first and foremost inspired by my dad, who has a, a kind of nine to five job, but has turned it into a way to travel and a way to do all the things that he's wanted to do. At one point in his life, he was like a, a rock climber, an ice climber, a triathlete. He succeeded in a very different avenue of life than I intend to ever really go down that ability to work through and, and make what you want to do a reality, I've always really admired in him. And then more specifically for indie comics, most recently, I'm, I've been really inspired by Eastern Daverna, who's a contemporary of mine, uh, and just makes some really freaking awesome comics. It makes me feel like I can make something cool in this industry and then make it and make it happen. I think you're leaving someone out. Who is the, I, I can't remember the writer's name, but the one that even made you want to be a writer in the first place because it was out of spite. <laughs> that was whoever wrote The Secret Garden. And I hated it so much. I wanted to be, a, I wanted to, to, to do better. <laughs> so I guess in a weird way, that one as well. Along the same vein as, as well, because my father and, and my parents were a, a huge inspiration, but not necessarily in a, a creative exploit. My dad's a very uh, blue collar guy worked the the nine to five his entire life basically had no aspirations in life other than to like be good enough to provide for a family and that's that's enough for him and that is super inspiring especially when you've got this this little red-headed shit of a kid 
who just wants to uh, make silly comic books and live frivolously. It took forever for me to get to a point where I'm like, oh, I love these aspirational dreams and I want to achieve those things. If I don't have that bedrock that really made my, my dad who he was, then I, all that other stuff doesn't mean anything. It's a diet of icing at the end of the day. That was a huge like wake up call and inspiration to me uh, as a person, as a creative, Oh God, do I go with Dave Pilkey or Grant Morrison? Because but Dave Pilkey showed me that I could actually make comic books because Captain Underpants was about eight-year-old boys who made comic books. And I was like, oh, I can do that. That's easy. And I've been reading Dave Pilkey ever since. But then Grant Morrison showed me what like comics could be. They don't have to be these little pamphlets. They can be sigils. They can be pieces of magic on their own. They can they can work with language and art in a way that no other medium can. And I'm continuously inspired by their work. Both of those things coming together really uh, make me the creative person that I am, I think. From a professional perspective, you have both created an amazing the comic series in both Mechaton and, of course, Frankenstein, the Unconquered, and I'm sure many others that we haven't had a chance to talk about, at least this time around, which means you both have to come back on in the future and talk about your... Hell yeah. I mean, comics. if you insist. I, look, I, I do because I'm Canadian. You know, it, it, it takes <laughs> much for us to twist a, a guest's arm to come back on, but you're both more than welcome to come back anytime you wish. From a professional standpoint, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourselves personally successful? <laughs> Let me have an existential crisis here. Um, I think we've been growing a lot in the last couple of years as creators. We've certainly hit a lot of achievements, a lot of milestones that we did not necessarily expect to hit. It's hard to like to you know pin down what successful means in this industry, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. I'm comfortable saying that I'm happy where we are and I'm happy where we're headed. So yeah, I'll, you know what? I'll take the leap. Yes, we are successful. We are a success. Uh, Four Color Comics, Wells Thompson, Dalton Shannon. Read all about it in the papers. <laughs> I agree with that. We, I think we are successful. My bar for success has lowered over the years, not necessarily because of setbacks or like reality setting in, but more of like discovering what I wanted out of life more so. Like the idea of actually like holding a book that was just uh, shadow people in my head, like holding that in my hands it is success to me. It doesn't matter who reads it. If anybody reads it, I would love you to read it. I would love if you pay me to read it, but it doesn't matter to me so much because at the end of the day, I'm just writing this stuff because I think it's cool and fun and it's for me. As long as I've got like a family and a support system and my relationships are taken care of, um, that's a success to me. The the icing on top is is the books, the, the art, and just holding something in my hands is enough of a, enough of a success for me. And it's such a good feeling that I can't wait to keep chasing that feeling like the dragon. Always be, be looking for the next success to hold issue two in my hands and three and four in the trade and all sorts of stuff. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Historically, probably pretty poorly, if we're being honest. <laughs> no, I do tend to take setbacks kind of personally. Pretty easy take to take. everything pay. personally. It's hard for me not to see a setback and like take it really, really personally. I, I think the, the the healthiest thing to do with failure is just try and figure out what went wrong and how you can improve it. I always make a point. So if we're talking about Kickstarters, if you know if one is more successful than the other, uh, we haven't. Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Everything else we haven't had one that hasn't funded yet that's been unsuccessful in funding. We haven't had to deal with the fallout of whatever that would look like. But at the end of every uh, Kickstarter, we ask ourselves, "What well, could we have done better? Why might this have been more or less successful than the last time around? Uh, what can we do to improve on it in the future?" I think that's kind of what you have to do to to continue moving forward. Even failure will happen; like it's inevitable. Uh, but I don't think it's. I don't think any failure is permanent. It's all just setbacks at the end of the day. The antidote to failure is just getting back up. It's not necessarily success in and of itself. Until you find out what success is for you personally, you're not going to be successful. You're just going to have this nebulous idea of what success is. So whenever you fail, it's going to feel like the entire rug got pulled out from under you. It sucks and it's depressive and uh, I drink more than I should. But it, failure doesn't necessarily mean it's the end. So, like, it, I take solace in that 
in that it's like, oh, sun rises tomorrow and uh, you can figure out what it like well said we you sit down you figure out what went wrong you it's a learning tool it's not a uh, death sentence having healthy coping mechanisms like having a good support system having uh, good habits to fall back on that isn't heavily drinking those are good to have everyone needs to uh, figure out what those are for them personally or failure is going to be more than just a setback it's going to be the final nail in the coffin and nobody wants that the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic writer a creative person in some way shape or form you know, the next generation is, is coming up being creative in some way. But how can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think inspiration always comes from just doing yeah. your thing. Like, it's it's not a formula. It's bringing who you are to the table. Um, and I think that's true of every every generation of creatives, the ones who inspire the most. They're not caring about, like, sales numbers or success rates. They're just making art that speaks to them and hopefully speaks to someone else. And it, and it usually does. So I think uh, not only the generation after us, but the generation after them, uh, as long as they're making stuff that means something to them, it's going to be worth it. And it's going to be a success. N nobody, but you could take that from you. Well, speak for yourself. But as far as the sales go, I definitely want some sales. <laughs> uh, uh, in inspiration's a funny, weird thing. I don't know how it is that we will or won't inspire the next generation. I think that showing resilience and showing adaptability is going to be big now because everything changes so quickly. Last year at Dragon Con, actually, I, I remember going to a panel that was like John Romita Jr. And it wasn't Chris Claremont, it was contemporary, but it was a bunch of people who were making co like comics in the 80s and the 70s, 80s and 90s. And they were talking about how they got started in the industry. And it was so weird and foreign to listen to them be like, yeah, well, what you do is you go to you go move to New York, get an internship, and then uh, you, you know, you work your butt off for a little while. And then they give you like, uh, they give you like a one issue th filler thing to do. And then you just you you press them with that. And then you can start making your own arts. And it's like, that is not anywhere remotely how any of this anymore. <laughs> It feels weird to like give people advice on how do I get started. The way we're getting started now in 10, 15 years will almost certainly not be viable for, or, or will just be extremely different that like our advice doesn't mean anything. If we're telling good stories and we're, we're doing our best to be earnest about that and get them to as wide an audience as possible, people will be inspired. I remember a while ago, I, I entered a uh, film contest with the story that Dalton mentioned earlier, adapted short story of a blind date going horribly wrong and then turns out they're a velociraptor in a wig. We adapted that into a short film, entered it in a contest, it won a bunch of awards, which was really cool. Next year, we came back with something entirely different. And one of the things that we noticed was that three or four of the other films featured like a guy in a mask that was like a frog or like some kind of animal mask something weird that was like very clearly kind of inspired by what we had done the year before. So I think if you're making things that are that are generally impressive, people will pick up on it. And it's just kind of up to you to, to keep making it and keep putting it out there and showing what's possible. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack? Soundtrack wise, almost certainly it would be like some soft Canadian like indie rock, uh, like metric, broken social scene. It'd be made up of things like that. Let's see, the title would be something along the lines of, I don't know, we'll figure it out later. The Wells Thompson story. <laughs> uh, mine would definitely be titled Why? And it would just be set to uh, early 2000s pop punk music. Uh, Fall Out Boy, uh, the, honestly, the whole scene. So Fall Out Boy, Blink-182, uh, MCR, Panic of the Disco, all, anything with high energy and uh, angsty lyrics. Well, I do hate to say it, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you both go, uh, and thank you again for, for coming on my show, I do greatly. Absolutely, uh, thank you. Is where can we find you? How can we support you both on, of course, uh, social media and of course where can we find the comics for me it's uh at wells thomp t-h-o-m-p at on twitter uh that's where i'm most active that's where you'll find me most often uh you can buy the comics through ko-fi ko-fi.com slash wells thompson uh 
all the comics that are available are going to be there. Uh, and you can usually find us running a Kickstarter uh, for either Frankenstein or Mechaton, or it, depending on how far in the future this is, maybe something else. But uh, we allow you to purchase all of our uh, comics through that as well. So if you catch us on a Kickstarter, support it, and then uh, get everything else in our catalog. I'm on every social site that matters, at Dalton K. Shannon. Uh, thankfully, that uh, wasn't taken anywhere. You can get the the books at the the Ko-Fi. Um, we've got Frankenstein, The Unconquered Number 2, launching on Kickstarter September 22nd. Uh, and from there, you'll be able to get anything and everything with our names on it. Well, you both have to come back on the show for sure. I, I can't wait Absolutely. to see what you do in the future. I'll try to go a little more introspective into your natures as creative people as well, too. I think we just scratched the surface in our conversation. So, Oh, no, it's okay. I'm like a kiddie pool. It's not that deep. <laughs> <laughs> that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because, you know, I'm only one person. Give me a break, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And our Patreon, which I'm learning and I'm updating as I go. So bear with me on that too, which is patreon.com forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Three Geeks Talking today. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it's still TGT. We're good. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah.